the talk for today, as you can see in the title, is Framing Wonder, a Mission for Design. So, Anne, please have the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and hello. Okay, uh, I'm going to explain what that means, because I think it's nice and obscure. But what I also want to say that this is a story of, of I think actually already Amanda has, has, has written a story saying that it was a story of, of love loss and the search for meaning, above all a new role for design. But I'd like to stress that it's a new role for design, so even if it might perturb designers to listen to this story, because I'm taking it off in a particular kind of direction, um, stress that it's not so much about how design makes futures, but how it might enable us to think about the future differently and, and make our own futures. Um, earlier this year I gave a paper called Design for Existential Crisis and since then I've been wondering how to build on that, um, what I can say that's positive. So I hope that this isn't going to come over as just too pie-in-the-sky utopian and I'd be really pleased to discuss that kind of thing with everybody afterwards. I also discovered in talking to a Norwegian friend that when you translate wonder, it stresses particularly the second part of this uh, equation. Um, the kind of wondering and thinking differently and asking about something as opposed to the sheer amazement. I don't know if that's true in Swedish as well, but I thought, well, if that's true in Scandinavia, I would start with my definition of wonder, which is a word I really like because it incorporates both a feeling of awe and being curious and questioning and sometimes challenging, as in feeling doubt. So I'll just put that up there and then ask you to listen to everything that I say from here on in with the thought that that might be where we're going. So the first thing that I want to do is show you this rather horrific image. If you can't immediately work out what it is, it's a hermit crab that has made its home in a doll's head. And it went viral on the internet. And I bring it up here for two reasons. One, because I'm going to be talking about weird things to do with you know, how we regard our role in, in the world. And this has been heralded for that. But also because it did go viral on the internet, it did cause a degree of wonder. And it principally did it, not so much in the context of, of how we're impacting on our world, but actually because it reminded everybody of the um, strange creature in Toy Story. So you've got these sort of two, two narratives. One is like, wow, look at this. And it's just like Toy Story, which is this really mediated world we live in. And the other is the... Uh, context that I met it in. Here you can see that actually if you look on the left hand side there are other hermit crabs that have made their homes in doll's heads and indeed that hermit crabs can make their homes in all sorts of things like shells so they do that kind of stuff. Um, but in the context here it also went viral as um, an example of the Anthropocene and this is where I first met it and I want to introduce the Anthropocene a little bit more because it's going to be part of what I'm talking about today. So um, it, Anthropocene, if you're not familiar with it, is a proposed epoch that dates from the start of significant human impact on the Earth's geology and ecosystems. And it includes but also transcends the duration of the anthropogenic climate change that we're experiencing now. And here I would say that it's not used um, to indicate any inevitability of human impact on other life, but to highlight the present relation of dominance and carelessness that we seem to be living through. So that's one starting position. Another one is about what we are as humans. And here I'm going to refer to the work of Bernard Stiegler, a French philosopher who some of you may be familiar with. But really, I'm going to summarize it. And this is the, you know, he's written about 26 books, and this is going to be four lines. So I hope you'll appreciate that that's not the whole story. Um, it's to claim that actually the very essence, the primordial essence of being, that to be human is to make stuff. It is that we are people that create our technologies around us and that in doing that we've allowed culture to develop and that we've also been able to evolve beyond just the mere survival of the fittest because we can scaffold what we're able to achieve through using technology and that implicitly in that, of course, is an acceptance that you know we're creative and that we make stuff as, as you know, it's not that we have technology, we've had to produce it and that this is very much part of our character. And uh, a UK scholar, Christina Howes, refers to it as, she says, you know, this is all about us not being stuck as the human. There is not a single condition that is the human. There is not one person that we are all like, but that it's humans exist. 
and they existed. And if it was the human, it would be this stasis and stuck thing. But actually, it's all about our perpetual curiosity, inventiveness and creativity. So I want to frame everything I'm saying and also draw attention to that within feminist theory. Perhaps if we put it into the words of Judith Butler, if we take a non-essentialist view of identity in that it's constantly malleable, mutable and changing, identity is socially achieved and persists because of social repetition. Within that, I would like to draw attention to the fact that our tools are part of what enacts this social repetition. So we need to think about it. But in the context of the Anthropocene, and a number of us have been talking about the punk era while I've been here. So this is a particular acknowledgement for those people who can remember that period. But the Stranglers had a track called Something But a Change. And I'm talking about you know, a world in which we're using three to five times planet's worth of the resources that we can actually manage. So we need to do something. And this was in 1977 when people weren't worrying about it so much. They obviously meant it in another context. But I also want to draw attention to the context in which I'm speaking, which is within Europe and out of Europe. And that when we make technology design, it's quite often as Northern Europeans or as North America. When we talk about the way that we're using resources, it's quite often in that context. But we are also affecting the rest of the world and other futures for other people and other beings and people who don't exist yet and all that kind of stuff. The other thing that I'd like to say before I really get going on some of my own work and how it might relate to this is that, you know, we're at the moment, we're still signed, and we not particularly, I mean, we've, Britain's just signed a contract for a nuclear power station, but there are coal-fired power stations popping up. There are contracts that have been signed really recently for this kind of thing all over the world. Um, I don't know whether it's going to change because um, China's starting to notice the impact of what's happening when it does it. But, you know, it's sort of like there are these things happening, um, financed internationally all over the world, and we can't necessarily do anything about that as individuals, and we can sit here and think, what can we do? So um, one of the things I'd like to then say we can do is think about what design can offer. And design typically, um, mainstream design, drawn from what could be called by some design anthropologists the close present, the present of a recent yesterday, a limited now, and an almost tomorrow. And I am suggesting that we need to raise our eyes above that horizon. But we have challenges, as, as Stuart Reeves says, designing projects us forwards, but we're not always able to judge where it will lead. I think we're not able to judge, sorry, I put an always in there. Even our best efforts to present the future in scenarios and stories merely reveal present preoccupations. And we don't always want to try. So here's something that was taken from a report last year, and I've highlighted the key line in it for me, which is design isn't just about beauty, it's about market relevance and meaningful results. And I think we can separate those ideas of beauty, market relevance and meaningful results, but we also need to note that if everything is going to be about market relevance, well, the market doesn't actually value biodiversity. I was having a chat with a classical econo economist um, only last week, and I was saying, well, you know, he said, well, we can cost trees. I said, yeah, but could we cost biodiversity? He said, no, that's more awkward. And if you can't demonstrate that it has a scarcity value, then it doesn't really work on the market. It can't give it a price. So we have a problem. So we have questions. And these are the questions that I was posing, and they're where I'm trying to build from. That what should designers do with their design skills and orientation to the future? As right-wing populism sweeps through politics, climate predictions worsen, mass migration escalates refugee numbers, new classes of automation threaten workers' jobs, and austerity policies destabilize society. Well, that's certainly been true in Britain. I hope Sweden is still slightly ahead of us on this one. But what's to be done when even broken concepts of progress no longer seem to be progressing? And here I just want to pause and lighten the mood a little bit and say, OK, that's what we're going to be talking about today. But I'm going to be talking about it in, the own, in my context. I can only really talk about my own work. And, um, and I've spent 10 years really working with, um, through observation and research, looking at how people at the grassroots level take action on their world and do stuff to change their environments. And so I'm going to be talking a bit about that. Um, for longer still, I've been investigating what it means to live in a digital age. And I've also been a hands-on maker of social process for quite a long time. So I'm speaking in that context. And so I want to shift gear a little bit and say, so, you know, here are some examples of some work. 
And there are a lot of things I'm not going to talk about today without ignoring them, because if I was the only person who was talking about this kind of stuff, then I think we'd be in a pretty difficult situation with respect to the world. But actually, I'm just one of many people talking about really interesting things. And we've got Christina here, whose works in, I would cite in this space. And I know that I just missed Maria speaking about how parts can encourage other cosmologies. And Emil, let's try again, Anders, Alison has a whole thesis on this kind of stuff, so I think it's very pertinent here. And I'm happy, happily building on that kind of stuff, but I'd like to sort of bring my own particular perspective. And now I'm going to go back, not nearly as far as I've been going back, as in not even as far as 1977, but kind of when I first started to get an idea of what Framing Wonder might be about in my own work. And I did promise something for people who are interested in the Internet of Things, and this is probably about as good as it's going to get. So back in 2004, um, I wasn't working as an academic that particular year. I was working more as an activist, and I was with a, a friend, and we were puzzling over what was going to happen when all sorts of physical objects just acquired unknown quantities because people can't sort of see those. You know, you can rearrange your living room furniture, but you can't rearrange the connections and where things are sort of... what what communicates with whom in the Internet of Things nearly as um, easily. And at that time, there was no Internet of Things because no one had invented the term. So we just talked about kind of invisible information. And this was the cartoon that we put out at the time. And then it took another three years and a proper affiliation at a different university and a funding application, and then started on something called Democratising Technology. So a few of you may know this work, and I apologise it's familiar, but I kind of wanted to give some background to where I've been going and, and how I think one might have a, you know, just move perhaps in a, in a good direction. So we were researching a workshop method specifically about how people engage in design decisions, but with a particular orientation to how they understand the network age and how we might be putting thought into values and what things might enable ahead of building them, because once you've built them, it's much more difficult to change things. But we realised that we were, lots of people had absolutely no idea what's going on in computer science departments and the kinds of things that are being talked of, and they were quite often excluded from discussion about technology altogether, and they had no idea how it could re-enable social um, arrangements. So we looked at ways that we might be able to do that through values. And what we did was work with a whole a series of groups of older people. We particularly picked older people because they tended not to be as conversant with the internet. And we got them to imagine um, things in the past, and this is one of the timelines, and then things in the future. And the past is heavily populated with things, that's the green side. We gave them a long run at the future because it wasn't about their own lives. It was They were able to be predicting for other people and, and caring about things that might happen in um, the future. And it was very poorly... Um, filled and quite often it was filled with things that they then realised had actually come to pass. So we realised that futures were all happening for them about between 16 and 21. They'd got an idea of what the future was going to be. So it was things like space travel and stuff like that, which when they were thought about it, well, that had happened. But then we thought, we went through a whole series of exercises and then we came back. And I'm just going to show you a little bit um, about um, what we actually did. And when we came back to it, their futures were much more oriented to the kinds of things that... Um, they were really genuinely worried about in the present. So this is Vi and Esther, and they have a whole pile of props in front of them, and they're just making their timelines, as you can see. I'm just going to give you a really brief extract of what we did and how it became a little bit transformational. So I was working with a performance artist, and she talks about telling the story of your object from the point of view of your character. We'd all got these, we'd all taken props, and Vi's got a glove, and Glover says, well, this glove has found a most beautiful owner, She's a dancer. She does exotic dancing. She travels the world and therefore so do I. I'm looked after very much, so I've struck many a fine face. It's just used when I'm doing my exotic dancing to attract a man. And anything you can attract a man has got to be good. You just hold that, says Lois. Well, you said to get into the part. And you can see her here. She's putting on her glove. But what actually happens, which is really interesting to be part of, and you'll see me, back in 19, back in 2007, working with her. So she's, at this point, telling me how it happens. And here she's, she's talking about seeing and, and reaching out and touching me. And this, the words that go with this is like, he brought a sort of glove with him. When you put on that glove, then you show you a picture within your own mind. 
though that person didn't change, but with your own mind, something happened. You know, like when you have a dream, and it was like this hallucination, and you could see that that person was a caring person, and she puts on the glove. So you see that through this person's eye, through this glove, as soon as you shook hands, once you had a contact, as soon as you have a contact, and at this point she's touched my hand, you've just seen. Can you feel it? Does that mean you can see into my soul? I can. And I had goosebumps. Because this is all happening in front of me and she's really just making this up and it's becoming quite real for her. And she was only with us for a few weeks working together. We didn't run everything in one go, we sort of spread it out. And when she left, this is one of the things, she didn't say this directly to us actually, she said this to somebody who was evaluating our project. She said, we went in as old people and came out as people with our own thoughts and agendas. And she had transformed her view of technology, and I have to say, not of networks, not at all. In some ways, this was not a particularly successful project because we didn't, you know, revolutionise the Internet of Things. But she did buy a laptop for her group and do all sorts of things that she said she directly attributed to having been involved. But this wasn't the end of the story. We weren't only working with Vice Group, we were also working with a group called the Geezers. And this is them in front of a picture at the... Uh, exhibition that they were involved with because one of the things we did we thought well we can do something which is an engagement just a little interaction with people but that's not a very long intervention be interesting to see whether if you work with socially engaged art you can actually create something which is a bit long longitudinal so we asked some artists to work with these different groups over a space of three months and this is just the story of what happened with one of them so this is the group that's been working and this is um Lorraine in the middle, who's, there, who's been their working artist, um, when they go to a barge, because what they had been talking about during the course of their project was how they felt there was an environmental challenge and that these guys had been, they'd been working on the docks, they were from the east end of London, they'd been um, electricians and things like that, and they felt that there were lots of things that they knew about water that weren't being actually used in... in, in um, in thinking about renewables. So it wasn't so much that they wanted to sort out the environment from the point of view of, of saving energy, which was a, the big framing at the time, but it was like, well, what can we contribute? We've got all this latent knowledge that we're not using anymore. So they worked with um, a young engineer, and it was very much their ideas, and they tested them out. And eventually, and this has taken the best part of eight years, so it's been one of those projects where you think, it, you know, you've got your you've got your 18 months and in that you've got your three months and at the end of the three months you get your exhibition and I think if I just nip back perhaps it'd be worth just looking you can see here you've got like a, a water turbine envisaged right well I've given away the punchline because you've seen this but this is them actually mounting it on the side of a barge in the river Thames in London and this is what they lit up with it which is their geezer power sign and the report and so what actually happened was that from being essentially quite bored, I mean, they admitted as much, they were just sort of meeting on a weekly basis, um, that they actually got the sort of bit behind their teeth, not only to think about the issues, but actually to start acting on them. So with democratising technology, we did produce an engagement process for people outside the mainstream of design. With, and we actually found it incredibly hard to get funding for them to do what I was calling citizen innovation. So we found, a, we found that you know, there were many facets to it, and one of them is also about the sort of forum in which you can actually make this stuff happen. And we did identify ways to make technology a bit more inclusive, or at least certainly incorporate a broader set of values and um, ways of working. And I argue that we also revealed the designed and therefore designable nature of tools and systems. But we also ended up with several unexpected material outcomes and some intangible outcomes, which was about really how one things, things can transform. And now I want to jump forward a little bit, because it took another three years and some more funding applications. And um, a whole bunch, which I'm not going to go through all of, but I'm just going to put up here, because the Connected Communities Programme was something that happened over 10 years in Britain been really lucky to have been funded on it quite a lot and that was very much a chance to look at how you can make transformations so we had a research program that was very much about action research and making difference and doing things that um, are transformational and just to introduce a couple of the projects that came up through this we looked at um, living sociably as we age and to do that, we brought people together and actually created an environment where they were kind of doing the convivial thing that we wanted to talk to them about. And uh, 
Originally, we thought we were going to be looking at how you could reconfigure buildings, retrofit buildings to make them more um, socially sustainable, possibly more environmentally sustainable. But actually, it became a study in how to design in conviviality. So they all met to do our research. We all met in cafes around the, around the north of England and in Scotland. And we decorated it and served um, sandwiches and cake in two courses. We put in questions. So we have all these little questions like, what would I share? When does it happen? Where does it happen? What does it mean to live flexibly? And things like that to get people started. And you can see here, they were sort of in the food, made sure that people took them out before they ate it, obviously. And, uh, and what was interesting there was, you know, so again, we were thinking very much about the social sustainability that underpins the way that people develop their environments. And using that practice of thinking about well, what does it take and what does it feel like for things to be different? And one of the people commenting just a, another quote from this, like we came in here today and there was an atmosphere with the candles on the tables, cakes, and it invited you in and you wanted to come in. Some communal spaces are just dead. And so they went out and they then thought about their communal spaces. And so again, it was something which had enough of its own, sort of it, its own genesis in, within the structure of it to get people thinking about how they could make their environment more as they wanted to do. And another example of how we work together in this kind of way was something called Grown Edible and Meaningful. And we produced a little booklet, and this is the cover of the booklet. And um, we ran a festival which brought people together to share um, how they had been growing things. And you can see here, it was actually in the end one of the most diverse things that the um, charity we were working with on it had ever run, which they found quite exciting. So we had community growing workshops, we had a food growing festival, we then interviewed and, and looked at some examples of case studies. And here we looked at particularly how growing food connects us to our environment and got people's comments. I don't know, is it legible for you up there? Okay, well, just a moment. Then things like we're expecting to eat so many foods out of season. We've lost connection to our own lands and what we can grow. But there's a whole lot of things that people came up with. But we also found this other dimension, that growing food connects us to people and places we love, some of which we may have lost. And here was very much accounts of people. We found that a number of people participating, it was inner, inner city Leeds that we were working, which is northern city in, in England. And... People were, people were full of stories about where the foods that they were growing had come from or why they cared about growing or who it reminded them of. And we, this became such a feature of the stories that we actually pulled it out. And we particularly featured a couple of stories that looked at, um, particularly um, these were sort of Muslim festivals and things like that, because it was at a point where we were actually trying to challenge some of the, uh, what should we say, the tensions that were appearing in, in narratives about immigrants within Britain. And so we've got the story here of somebody who talks about what it means to have brought over a, a lemon tree from her home in Bangladesh and who it reminds her of. And the fact that when it died, they then had to go and get another plant. So it's all this sort of narrative around it. And in doing so, it was really, again, one of those experiences where you realised that people were talking about things that they didn't often get a chance to speak about, and there was something quite powerful in what they were reflecting on. It wasn't just that they do this, and they don't always think about it, but actually being in a project where the purpose was to think about it, they were able to actually articulate it, and, and perhaps in emotional terms, in terms that are not always available in, in kind of public spaces. So by that point, we were thinking, OK, we we're actually starting to see a, quite a lot of a social activity and people, in very small ways, trying to make their environments better and richer. So we worked with this project, which is the last one I'm going to feature from this series, with something we called Effectiveness in Action. And it was a group of social activists picked as social activists. They're all different kinds of, of action. Some people were just like taking direct action, really in conflict over sort of an issue with the police. Others were doing artistic practice. Others were just doing um, very gentle things that they felt were making their environment better. But what we were all doing together was trying to work out what it was that, that sustains people when they're taking those kinds of challenges. 
So we gathered all the stories. We, we got people together to tell stories and we got them to talk about what it was that motivated them and how they kept going. Because one of the things is that it's quite, if you're, if you're fighting a system that's bigger than you, it can be tiring, burnout involved and things like that. And so it became a story about actually about how to nourish people who were doing things that might be more tactical um, and not so much about any tactics, but actually just about how to keep going and book for others and way of finding reverence in unlikely places. So in doing that, I found myself watching people and doing stuff that doesn't produce... It wasn't like doing where you go and study people, but by actually bringing people together in these combinations, I began to realise that you can actually bring people together to reflect on things and possibly even create new potential. So I'm going to make an assertion now that it's not merely just what people would have done if they'd all been watched by me in their normal practice, but that actually this practice of staging encounters, which is something that I know goes on, amongst many of the practitioners here, is something that actually we discover something about our potential, we learn, we know that we can be different through doing this kind of thing, and that we, const we constitute our world and our potential in doing this kind of thing. So I think it's a really, I found myself thinking, well, this is a very important practice. I need to find out more. People can be great together. And... I put it together in a paper called Troubling Futures because there's both the sense of troubling as in worrying and troubling as in the sense that you can play with them and be a bit, a bit provocative. So my last series of, of work that I was going to mention today is what I've called the World Series. And these have actually become almost detached from full-blown projects. They're like mini experiments that I've been making. Um, not just wondering what amazing things that humans can make, but thinking about ways that we might inject values, talk about it um, collectively, take some responsibility and try and exert some control over the things that are happening. So I'd call these thought experiments. Um, I wanted to research and develop and harness the power of transformative thinking in as much as we can pin that down at all. I don't know if I have, but this is, this is where I'm at at the moment. This is the series of work that I've been doing recently. So just to run through a few. First of these experiments was called World Machines. What we did here was ask people to think about a kind of machine for the whole world. What would we do um, if we could think about what we, if we joined up the whole world and used feedback systems, what kind of technology could we use? What kind of management systems would we need? But we did it very much as a thought experiment. We weren't trying to actually make a piece of technology. I mean, I'm still trying, actually. I think it'd be great to actually make a world machine. But at this point, it was very much a, a, a device for getting to think about how things could be different. So we asked about it as a form of resistance, as a rhetorical device, and as a utopia. And then we got everyone making a world machine manual. So what you've got behind here is somebody's world machine machine for making manuals, which was a nice twist and it sort of de deepened the whole thing. And I think um, if I, if, probably easier to read it up here. Do not feed the machine. And then I think it's something like do to the machine as you would have the machine do to you, and those kinds of things. So they're very... Um, abstract kinds of things, but very much incorporated a set of values about how people wanted to live. And in another workshop, we got this fantastic piece of work out of, out of a group, which again, you wouldn't expect something terribly practical when you've been asking people to think about rhetorical devices and utopias, but they did work collectively really to think about the kinds of things that they did and didn't want in the world. And it worked with a range of people, from students to fellow academics to people sort of out in the world. Um, so that's one of my um, kind of world series. More recently, I tried another one, which is called On Some Other World. And this structure here is a very large box that produces worlds. And um, the idea is that you get a world that isn't necessarily the one that you recognize. So here is an example worlds. Um, this is the first one over here is a world in which the Russian Revolution has failed. This is the world, uh, you might have to know a bit of um, English history or English, um, English history, which was that Catherine of Aragon was a queen. Um, she was the person who was associated with the moment when 
Britain left Rome as a, as a religion because um, she didn't have a healthy male heir. So um, Henry, our Henry VIII used it as an excuse to divorce her, but he couldn't get a divorce without making his own church. So we got the Church of England. So this is really big in, in English history and probably not that consequential for people in Sweden. But anyway, we were doing this one in England. And at the top, you can see one which perhaps was the most interesting in terms of what came out of it, which was the Brazilian rubber monopoly continues. So we ended up with people creating a world where rubber is very scarce and there's a layer of people who live very close to the earth and who own tarmac and things with like rubber wheels. But the people who don't have access to it live on ships out in the sort of stratosphere and they develop ways of flying about in the air which are really um, sort of straight out of um, sort of Gulliver's travels. But all this sort of thing. But the point of doing all this was that um, rather than getting people to think about futures, which is quite difficult, we were saying, well, what would your present world be like if it hadn't been the same? And we used things that were relatively... Um, big and distinct. We also used what, what, what would have happened if, um, if the whole of um, um, San Francisco and, sort of, and, and Silicon Valley had, had been lost through a, sort of the eruption of the San Andreas Fault, to get people to think about how we might have ended up with a, a different technology or led by a different area um, or anything else that happened to inspire them. So, but we really let people with, um, run in their own direction. And I'm just going to show you an example of what came out of this. Again, I mean, we, didn't, we weren't requiring people to make products, but we were requiring them to think about how things might be different. And we, um, it was based on the work of Philip K. Dick, who has become a bit of a theme this year, as you may, many of you may have been seeing Blade Runner, um, the new one. But in this case, we were looking, this group was looking at what had happened if the Axis rather than the Allies had won the Second World War. And this was... Um, a brochure for cultural surgery. And this was if you had to engineer a different past for yourself um, in terms of data, how far could you go back and how much data could you change? But what kind of implications would that have for your relatives who suddenly found that maybe the richest person in the family had dispossessed you of your heritage by just deciding that they needed to be a different nationality for the purposes of their profession or their future? And you know, would new industries grow up around this kind of thing? So there was sort of things that that was a very dystopian vision. Some of them were, um, as I said, like the airships were rather um, lovelier. So I just want to kind of catch up with where we've got to at this point and say that, you know, what's been motivating my work is to think about how we might design differently. No longer appropriate that we use design to subjugate other forms of existence to our will. I know most of us are not doing that, but if we look at the history of human development, it's largely been to make sure that we were dry and safe and had food. And most of that has meant developing a science that allows us to control our environment. And now we found that we've perhaps over-controlled some aspects and, and used far too much resource in the doing of it. So... But we have to balance that. We can't just stop making because it's human to create. You can see when people have their creativity stifled that they, it's actually one of the things that makes people go sour. And so we don't really have an option of stopping making. So how do we make different? I'm suggesting here that we can make things that are fun and positive and leave people feeling better about each other. And some of these can contribute to new ways of thinking, future making new futures. So I made a list of some of the things that I'd enjoyed in the process of working with people and I'd seen eyes light up and people work collectively in a positive kind of way. And you can see that there, there's no, as I said, there's no rocket science in this. Nurturing life, imagining difference, whole basis of design, sharing conviviality, telling stories, feeling engaged, using the body or the emotions, mind, expressing curiosity or challenge, learning about others, I put others in um, big letters to represent also the kind of social science construction of others in the sense that it's not just learning about people who are like you, but actually really learning about difference and understanding how all the politics of difference might work. Experiencing common gainful labour, common in the sense of being both everywhere all around us, but also in the sense of being shared. Taking action and reflecting on practice. I thought, wow, you know, that's what really what we've been doing. And in the process, you know, using quite a lot of paper and sticky, sticky glue and 
um, pens and stuff, but not a great deal of resources. So I thought, well, this then can be framed as wonder, but particularly only really works as wonder if you actually have that sort of second order thing where you're noticing and delighting in and of it. It's not enough to do it, but you actually want to feel how great it is to do it and do it with other people. So there's something here as well about attention and that brings me on to the next thought, which is designing for attention, which focuses on human flourishing and addresses qualities of humanity rather than the preservation of human societies at all costs. So this perhaps is a bit, a bit kind of, whoa, in the sense though that actually we want to live in a world where those sorts of things are what we're doing rather than just having on with our, with our, you know, sort of our hands clenched and our, you know, so it shouldn't, shouldn't have to be like that. That's not to say that there isn't room for some, some of the somberness of the things that may yet be happening. So to quote Robin Wall Kimmerer, paying attention to the more than human world doesn't lead only to amazement, it leads also to acknowledgement of pain. The least we might do as we strive um, is for the grace to accompany fellow species towards theirs and perhaps our own extinction. But we need to pay attention if we're doing that to the things, to things that we don't wish to see and things that are uncomfortable as well as just the beautiful sunset. So how do we deal with that? And I'm going back to a relatively theoretical level here, having told you the sorts of things that I've been doing. No great claim other than that it's been a joy to work in that kind of way. This is probably my favourite quote of anything ever, which is Jane Bennett's work, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. One must be enamoured with existence and occasionally even enchanted in the face of it in order to be capable of donating some of one's scarce mortal resources to the service of others. And we're all doing things for each other all the time, but we might be about to have to scale that up because we've got a lot of common challenges that are bigger than the turn to right-wing popularism are even bigger than that. But that might be being a response because that's been taken away from so many people do not feel enamoured of the world that they're living in. There's been a loss of dignity and it has turned people into, into the sourness of not being able to create, not being able to contribute, being marginalised, being undervalued, being told that they don't count. And I think that we really have to get past those sorts of things, we need to be working together to produce something that re recognises dignity, that makes people feel relevant, That does because this sort of thing does not promote enchantment or generosity with mortal resources. Um, so, these are the empty chairs. What does it mean? Well, I going to refer back to Viktor Frankl, he was a psychologist who particularly looked at meaning. And if we are finding meaning in a fraught world that needs to change radically and is changing radically, he talks about a survival value in the will to meaning. But as to mankind, there is only hope for survival if mankind is uni united by a common will to, make, to a common meaning. In other words, by an awareness of common tasks. So what is that task? And I would say... And this is where it comes back to design. It's to re-enchant the human world with the rest of existence, or just to re-enchant the human world with existence. That we have a common cause as big, any, big as any conflict that has ever united humans. We need to establish ecological citizenship. We need to mobilise alternative cosmologies, to use Maria's phrase. Our role is to recognise our obligation and care as designers and fellow custodians and do something about it. So these are my questions. What results in fulfilment, if that's the opposite of a loss of dignity? What supports a compassionate response? What brings us all into constructive intimacy? What cultivates a creative mind? What is the decent society? And how do we design for these, bearing in mind? that circumstances change and change again. Now, I should have said at the beginning that I'm very good at questions, some of them quite difficult, not very good at answers and not very good at endings. But I'm going to come back to this picture. 
and say, well, yes, this is the kind of thing that creates wonder and horror. But there are also things, certainly things that, um, just simple things that perhaps we all know or we don't know. Like, I didn't know there was a word for this, but petrichor is the word for the smell of when rain has hit dry land and there's a sort of a smell in the air. I don't know how many of you also notice that. I really, really love that smell when it first starts to rain after a dry period, especially when there's some heat. Well, this is the Wikipedia entry on it. And it also talks about how it might be one of those things that's actually contributed to human survival over the years because it's the point where things are fertile again and we can go out and plant and stuff like that. But just that smell, just that thing, just that small thing that makes it worth being alive. So, framing wonder, a mission for design. I would say that design has a role in helping people see things around them. Not inspiring wonder in the design, but getting out of the way. Making the extraordinary, ordinary world around us the focus. That's what the frames do. Tears, the tools can disappear as the frames disappear around things. And they can show us what's common. And I mean that in both senses of what's together what's all of ours and what's just around us and ubiquitous. There's a whole lot of things that one can theorise from this. Politics to futures, that we can just be discussing these ethics in the context of being designers, that beyond a consideration of future making, we can actually consider how we impact, how we, that relates to the present. There's a whole group of people who are interested in future making which is not just about making futures, but about looking at the alternatives, how these things happen. Design is about changing, changing cultures in this context, as well as making things. We can be different, and we need to be different, and we need to continue to be differently different as differences needed, and we can do more of that. So, I think jump that and just go to this. The end of the world is always present and worrisome to different degrees. What's interesting is how we choose to respond to it. With thanks to 15, 20 years of collaborators and participants. And any questions? Thank you. I didn't know the word petrichor, but I saw it was a quote from Paul Kelly, the Australian musician. Are you, is that where you got it from with your Australian background? Or no? I'm trying to remember why I found it, but when I found it, I just thought, my God, there's a word for this, but yes. So I would like to uh, invite Parandos here again on stage. And Parandos, as I said, um, associate professor here, and also the organizer of the network around alternative future making, which obviously makes perfect sense in relation to this. So please, Parandos. Okay, thank you, Anne, for this amazing story about opportunities uh, for, for our, us as designers. And we have some design students here too. So I'm quite, I mean, in one way, it's almost like a, an approach to life or a, almost like a philosophy. Or how, how do you recognize when you do talk about this kind of design in, in the design community in general? Um, I mean, I find more examples, though, going in this direction. I think there's lots of work going in this direction. I've just been trying to understand something of the process that it's invoking in doing so. I also found, I mean, I was quite shocked at what happened when I gave the paper called Design for Existential Crisis, how many young people studying design, studying human-computer interaction or interaction design, came up to talk to me about it afterwards because they'd been struggling with a feeling of impasse that they knew that something had to happen. They knew that they were probably destined for a job in an industry that they didn't fully believe in because it wasn't tackling market forces and looking at bigger issues. And they didn't know where to go. And the, the uh, challenge for me was that I'd actually written that paper because I didn't really know how to see past it myself. So I wrote that and then I was like, well, the the next thing is to offer something that's a bit more constructive than saying, hey, <clears throat> we have a problem and we're all in it together. Um, and I've 
worry that this now sounds, rather than sounding wholly dystopian, this now sounds a little bit too utopian. So there's a balance because people's livelihoods are involved here. People make, make their living making things. And so I'm not rejecting that, but I'm saying like, if we start to make things that re-enchant re ourselves, I mean, at the moment, the tendency of anything is going in a different direction. And I, one of the reasons I really like the Internet of Things is that it brings us back into the physical environment rather than just making us entirely screen-based. And I think the screens are great. It's really exciting. But if we're just amusing ourselves to death, as somebody once famously said it, then, you know, it, then we're in, that's, that's our fate. That's what's going to happen. We're not going to see past it. We'll be busy making exciting technologies instead of recognizing how great we are um, at, at just being human. So I think it's, I'm arguing for very embodied, not only, I mean, obviously with the body, but embodied in a, in a sense of like enjoying what we have around us, which is a really hard thing to say when there's so many people having a really difficult time. But actually almost it's more important now that weather's destabilized and people are having a more difficult time to find those great moments. I haven't put any Rebecca Solnit up here, but I realise I probably should have done because she talks about how um, how these small acts of kindness collectively make disasters into things that actually sometimes can enrich aspects of people's lives, even while they're struggling with the rest. Sorry, did that answer your question at yeah, all? Partly, but I'm, I'm also thinking, I mean, today when design thinking is, or has booming for a while, and have you, ha have you tried this with civil servants trying to find the new smartest method of, of some kind of design me method to, to produce some efficiency or, I mean, talking about how to nurture being more attentive or, I mean, I would love if mm. the civil the servants we work with... I think that's a really good challenge. Um, we're more likely to be working with industry than civil servants in some respects in Britain now. I mean, I've really noticed since I've been in Sweden how much is enacted through the public sector. And that's really a really strong friend to have because it doesn't always work to market forces. Um, I think we're in a different place. And obviously we could be working with civil servants, but they have a tendency at the moment to be so so battened down by the fact that they don't have much resource anymore, that probably that isn't our first place to start. And, but we've got huge, I mean, I missed, sadly missed, um, the Transition Towns talk um, last week. But that seems to me, you know, that there are lots of people who are just getting up and doing things and re-enchanting themselves. And then I suppose the challenge is, yeah, how do we start to talk about it to a broader um, group of people? I haven't talked about it to civil servants in Britain. I'm really just responding to um, where, where my practice has been going over the years and reframing it for myself. So maybe I shouldn't have come with something that's so fresh and it should be better, better tested, you know. But it, it, it's that sense of like, well, how does this play? What do people think? And yeah, I would love to take it into a Swedish civil service context to see whether as the most, as this very powerful um, agent in Swedish life, it'd be really interesting to see what would happen. No, I think I, I think it uh, would make sense a lot uh, for them actually, um, and I'm also thinking about this when you work with these elderly people. It seemed to be a lot of power in that when they started to realize how they actually could contribute. I mean, in a way, I mean, this is amazing. This is really a potential of future making. Uh, could you elaborate more on? Uh, I mean, what could the vision be? I mean, well, it's uh, a lot of people that could be you know, nurtured to engage more in society, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're giving our old people such a bad press in Britain at the moment because they have tended to be the ones who've been very cautious, who've been voting for, you know, sort of leaving Europe and, and the young people, and you know, are really angry with them for that and they're angry with them for squandering resources and not being practical with them and things like that. But actually, most of the people I know of that generation feel like, you know, they've done, they've done their work born their children and brought them up. And there's a sort of gap now where they want to be able to give back and use their life experience. They were really enthusiastic about having opportunities to do that. And I would hope more would appear, although now that we're all going to be working longer, maybe that particular 
sort of golden spot where everybody was able to get involved. But I think it was also class for, it was a class-based thing to some extent here, because if you're middle class and you retire and you go off and do your university of the third age or you do your non-executive directorships and things like that, whereas for another group of people, they really were just sitting around. Um, and that's such a waste of human potential, and they could see that too. So there was this real sort of wind behind them. And that's a huge force if people can be motivated to do it. But it's interesting that there's a sort of sense of generations in, in tension at the moment, at home anyway. Um, so yeah, totally. What do you think uh, is the challenge for, for designers going in this direction? I mean, it's kind of partly new ways of work, you need to be attentive to us relationships and, and I guess also other fields and disciplines like, I don't know, art of hosting or, or might work in, in similar ways. And, and uh, you also argued like the design as a kind of ant anthropology uh, and in, in one way having people just see each other's practice and starting to reflect over each other's practice in a way, deliberate them for reimagine new futures. So, I mean, are we needed as designers, or, or do we have new new friends or cousins? Or, um, well, it's interesting how, um, how um, some anthropologists have been becoming more and more fascinated by the power of design. Um, but I think. In one way, it might be the other way around as well. Or uh, absolutely, I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. But I think, um, for me, some of it is also that we're... It, it, you know, what's the difference between design and facilitation in these contexts? Well, if you design a social process well, that is a kind of design. It's also a kind of facilitation. People do not arrive together to study each other's practice because they just thought of it. That actually has to be something that comes from somewhere. So I suppose, yes, I'm, I'm very, perhaps selfishly, um, having said that I design social process um, now, suggesting that everybody else gets on and does it too. I mean, I think the biggest challenge may be that I'm, I've just come from a workshop on automation. And the question is, well, what do you do with all the people, particularly now hitting a different, a different group of people who've traditionally been protected from mechanisation, taking away their jobs, suddenly not having work. And are they all just going to be sitting around? So there may be more people. And then we're talking about, well, what about the care economy? You know, there's all this potential for everybody to be doing more caring and more noticing of wonderful things. But nobody had the, could sort out the resourcing issue for that because we still depend on on currency, on on trading, on on money, on things like that. And I'm not suggesting we can abandon those things. But I think it's really interesting to think about what well, what would a transition from the material look like, not just as, well, we have to stop making things, but what do we make instead? Because we have to make something. That's what I think. I think we should all be making things all the time. And when I was working with a performance artist, she said, what have you made? And they, oh, we don't make anything, we don't make anything. She said, have you ever made a cake? Yes. Have you ever made a mess? Yes. And people started to realize that, yeah, they had made stuff. So I think that's it. We're making a mess, but we're making a healthy mess. I don't know if we should see if we have some questions in the audience. Thank you for that. Um, I want to ask you about... Oh, yes. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions, but I'll start with, with one. And it's... Um, it was striking to me seeing the... Uh, hearing you talk about the 2004 workshops with the older men and the older women. And I was struck by how the older men had the knowledge and they produced something in the world, whereas the older women seemed to have the poetry and the storytelling and the tenderness. And I was wondering if it was something about the structure of the workshops that had some sort of gender divide between it. I'm wondering, could you actually have mapped the women's activities and produced something tangible based on their knowledge and skills in the world? And had the men produced something that was much more related to the, you know, the imagination and, and uh, development of agency and, and generation of touch. Um, I don't know if that was the same workshop structure that was run for each of these different ones. Um, but I was a bit con concerned yeah, and curious yeah, about yeah. the, the no, so gender I dynamic. Would like, I, yeah, I, can, I think I can speak to that. So it was exactly the same process and some were mixed groups and I just didn't happen to show 
they're both. And yes, it was the men who set off on it, and we were very aware of that because the women, it was to some extent potluck which artist you got. So she was good at cultivating their sense of where they wanted to go next. And we had another artist working with a different group who wanted to create um, a particular kind of artwork. So people were sort of squeezed into their structure, whereas working with Lorraine, they got to express what they wanted to do. And there was a gender divide, but I don't think we created it because what we were talking to was people who'd been in the workforce without much choice about how they'd ended up working with it. And most of them had gone down the machine shops in the East End. And some of them had got things that they could, could, could see a pertinence to. But the women had tended to get out of that. They'd been educated to 14, worked till they'd been married, then raised children. And so the, we, were, we were amplifying it, but we weren't creating it, if you see what I mean. We did talk about that because we became very aware of that. That, that was striking for me, thinking of the, the futurity, the fast forward of where we are now in terms of our gender and racial stereotypes. Because I, I could see the 50s and 60s. I mean, we call it a stereotype, but it was the reality of the way they lived. And then it came out in 2004. So the future making that we're making now, I mean, it's, we're, we're setting what we've got now is, is going to have a sort of fast forward impact about what will come up in the future too, which is... A yeah, and that wasn't... Um, the, I was more telling about how I ended up finding my, my people kept doing environmental things when I wasn't. That was interesting that this was me talking about network values. And actually both sets, both genders, all five groups we worked with were very articulate on the values they wanted to see. And there wasn't a particular gender divide in that area, but that wasn't in the end what I've told you of this story, because actually it was the way that people got sort of got a wind behind them that I wanted to tell the story of. And actually for one reason or another, that was a small group of men. And you're right, I think there are reasons for that that are quite gendered. And then there are other reasons that were just also to do with the structure of the project. But we didn't set out to create that. And I think it will have implications. And it's a little bit like when we talk about how our algorithms are, are made. If we're using a whole lot of material based in a world that has been reflecting those divisions, then they're going to learn them and amplify them. And that's what they do. So yeah, we have to be mindful. And when I said fast forward, I meant feed forward. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Uh, now, the question I'm um, asking is, is a bit difficult to, to, to ask in the sense that, um, well, 10 years ago, even 10 years ago, but even more so 20 years ago, uh, when designing for the future, we would have been using young kids or young adults. Uh, now you're standing here talking about designing for the future with old people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you are not the only one. This is my this is my point. Okay. I I uh, have come across the 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 past year a number of uh, my friends and colleagues who are doing exactly the same. For ex one example is Karen Ross in Newcastle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, are we getting old? Or is there a particular theoretical trend within design research that I've, complete, that I've completely missed? Well, first of all, I would say that 10 years ago was when I was doing the work with older people. And I've actually been getting younger since. So I'm going backwards, but because that work was one of the f first pieces of work, really, um, sort of, well, it wasn't one of the first, but I mean, it was one which originally I was responding, and the reason we ended up with working with older people was that, and I think Yankee will, will endorse this, was that at that point, they were being excluded from things routinely. And all the discussions about older people were like, well, what kind of, what colour walls do they want in their care home? So I was going like, well, actually, if we're going to use a group who are really marginalised to test out how we bring different voices in, if we use older people, then we're actually asking them not to design their own environment. We're asking them to design for a world that they might not even see. And that is a really, really different thing to do. So in that sense, at that point, I don't think Karen was doing it, you know. So... Um, yeah, and now I find that because I'm asking questions about, you know, let's build world machines or on some other world, I'm actually working with a really different generation. But that's not because I only want to work with one generation. I think there are 
periods where people have more reflective time. What I've discovered is that parents with young children, and there may well be some here, um, probably do less of this kind of thing than younger people and older people because they don't have the spare capacity um, emotionally and intellectually to get on with stuff. And then someone's got to be saving the world, so we look at a different group. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if that answers the question. But um. We have some more questions. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about, um, as you say, designing social processes and the relationship with democracy and especially uh, representative parliamentary democracy. Um, just to kind of relate this to my own experience, um, I was a postgraduate student when in the UK we had the, uh, the protests about student fee increases and all this stuff. And that was an extremely uh, invigorating time politically because a lot of students and a lot of campuses were having their first experience of organizing, occupying, direct action, lots of things like that. Um, and it was, it was wonderful, it was great. At the same time, uh, recently, like you've mentioned, uh, the, the Brexit vote and other things like that, and there's a feeling that there's um, problems with uh, how representational democracy, parliamentary democracy, is working, especially in countries like the UK and America. I can't speak so well to the Swedish situation. Um, do you see the kinds of uh, the, these processes and working with young people or old people do you see that as something that can be used to shore up parliamentary democracy? Or do you see it as something that ought to be, uh, to use your metaphor, scaffolding it, supplying something around the outside that doesn't add on to it? Do you think those things are intention, or do you think those are things that need to be solved together? Because I, I, wonder, if there is, I wonder if there's tension between them, because you can have people who are quite committed to uh, social justice movements, organizing. But they will organize in homologous ways to small fascist organizations that uh, spring up and cause a lot of damage. So I wonder if you could just speak to sort of the relationship between design, democracy, and especially institutional forms of democracy. Um, yeah, probably. I could go on for hours, but I'm not sure that I'm particularly well qualified. Um, I haven't addressed that side of things in this talk. I think it's interesting how the way that our technologies change also changes our understanding of what consultation and participation mean. And we're now at a point when we're judging who should stay on Big Brother on a you know daily or weekly basis, and yet we're voting every, well, every five years or something, four years, depends where you live, um, on who should run our country. And then we have something in Britain anyway called representational democracy where they're supposed to act on our behalf and we have given them that power and I do wonder now whether there shouldn't be kind of other houses or other I really like what happens in Ireland where you have kind of people I mean citizens juries where people or citizens assemblies where people are able to actually engage with issues and learn about them and then actually be more like spokespeople for broader people who will not be able to engage with the complexity of those discussions and I think those sorts of things are the sorts of things that you know feel in a way like some of the little world world series of things are getting people to understand more experientially and creatively some of the things that scientists might be telling them in another capacity helping them think and feel about what could be different because when you first walk into a room and you're just you're just arriving and it's like well how can I make a contribution to something as enormous as this? And yet there are techniques for helping people through into that process. And I would really like to see a socially engaged artist, for want of a better term, working with every community and helping people learn and feel agency and and do it in a meaningful kind of way. Because I think that would be more, more should we say, useful than the big democratic processes of our time, which seem to be increasingly giving way to large neoliberal um, processes of commercial imperative. So there's all sorts of things playing out there. So there's loads and loads of things that we can do, like prefigurative politics and be the, be the, you know, the design can be making the things that we want to see in microcosm. But 
that's all going to happen with like, well, do ultimately we want people to decide? Because at the moment, there's no evidence. At the moment, we're quite happy to let technology decide. We keep talking about how we, have, we can't possibly impose values on technology because that would be to impose values on technology. It might not evolve in the way that it should if we impose values on it. You're thinking, well, what, what, what's it going to evolve with anyway? You know, it's going to have values. Um, or, you know, we, you know, what should we say? You know, sort of deifying... Um, a, part of, you know, a, a representational democracy that is now obsolete. Um, but I think that's going to go well beyond the time that we have here. I don't know if that even begins to speak to your thing. Any other questions? Pandas? Shortly. I mean, oh, no, sorry. So, uh, as someone from the third world, I find your idea of having a more participatory approach to technology and design very appealing. But I also find things like the Green Revolution or vaccine campaigns, which are more coercive, more imposed, very appealing at the same time. So, I'm wondering, in your vision of the future, is there still a place for coercive power? I don't have a vision of the future. I just have a few things that might help us get one. Um, that's the first thing to say. Um, secondly, cursive power. I think there are people who know more than I do about things. I think that's true for every person on the planet. And in that case, I want somebody who knows more about something than I do to tell me what to do in some situations. And if it's about the power of inoculation or something, good on them. Um, this is a much broader discussion about design than that answers. But yeah, I don't see it as an either or. Okay. Yeah, well, I was also curious on the relationship between democracy and, and future making. It's, it is a tricky I'm, one. I'm aware of that. I also <laughs> that I might, but, uh, but, uh, I'm possibly about to be put on, on a, a website. <laughs> and my own, but, my own feelings at the moment about democracy are coloured by having come from a country that I think has made a complete hash of it in the last few months and, you know, year. What manifest as democracy and now is being called the will of the people is something that is so utterly exploitative and controlling and has closed down public discourse in Britain that you know to talk to me about democracy at the moment but but for me I mean what you have presented is a quite elaborative way of how to form different publics I mean in the present with a welcoming atmosphere with everyday questions, but still also very existential and big questions. Uh, so I, I think in a way it, it is a repertoire of how to, to engage people to, to uh, approach really tricky things in, in, a, in a welcoming form. Isn't that a way of forming new publics? Isn't that no, part of essential agree. part of uh, democracy? Or Yes, I, I, I'm, my reaction is just is just a visceral one to the word at the moment, um, totally. And I would see it as exactly that. It's a, it's a mixture of producing something that shows people a different way of being. In that sense, it is a bit prefigurative. Look, we can sit here and we can debate and it's not scary. And one of the things I find most inspiring, um, which I think may have been created by somebody I met through design circles, is a kind of listening movement that's built up in Britain at the moment, which is specifically aimed at getting people on two sides of the stay remain discussion to sit together and try and understand each other's perspective rather than just hurling words at each other, which is what's been going on quite a lot. Um, and it's exactly that. It's designing a social process. It's like you go, the certain, certain um, protocols are observed, certain respect is manifested, it has, it has worked in certain ways to be effective, it draws on conflict revolution, resolution, and so on. And those things, I think, are enormously important. And, and I know they're not overlooked at all at this university. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I was so pleased to visit. But I think that those, those kinds of methodological things about how you bring knowledge, experience, and, and conviviality together to work is 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 regularly overlooked in process. So I think, yeah, I would say that that's really important. And um, I'm far from the only person researching it, but I've been trying to distill something that I could perhaps be more explicit about in talking to people. 
can I ask you another question? <laughs> I want to pick up on being attentive, so mm. getting to the uh, embodied or material side of, of your work. And I'm wondering if you as the designer have strategies for crafting the somatic practice of attention. And for example, I, today I spent some time in two different VR worlds mm -hmm. that were designed worlds with different design goals. And actually when I walked into your talk, I was experiencing severe VR nausea. <laughs> but I realized that, that these were worlds for directing not just my actions and my reactions, but my attention. And I think that it's an under, incredibly important, but under-realized um, or, it's a domain that, that influences design and that designers influence, but it's almost as if designers circle around the fact that what they're actually doing in some ways is designing attention or focus. Or yeah. And I'm struck by your talk too and the lovely pacing of it too. So in a way, with your presentation, you're crafting the way we attend to you. That would be the less conscious part of what I was I know, doing. I know, but yes. But... but um, I mean, I know that there was quite a lot around the attention economy um, for a while and, and things like eye tracking in a very functionalist way of actually saying, well, you know, when, and was particularly with websites, when, but VR would be a case in point, when, you, when you're looking at something, you're not looking at something else because that's the nature of human beings. So where do, you, where do you make sure people, you know, where's the place where they're going to spend most or something was a, a big discussion. And I've just been working with a, a young man who's put together a, a really nice bit of, of 360 VR, where by looking at something for a, a one and a half seconds, you you control where you move. So you know those sorts of things, which are which do acknowledge it. But I think I think because it's seen as a competition, it's almost it's part of the market forces thing. Attention is yet another thing that people are buying and selling, and so it's very much in there, but it's in there as a as another commodity. Um, obviously, I'd like to decommodify it because I think that it's what we have. But training attentiveness, isn't that a way also to really prepare for the future that you don't know what will come? The more you train, I'm really shifting your attentiveness. Well, there's a lot of work going on in, in mindfulness, which I think is motivated by that getting people, I mean, there's some cynical stuff about it, which is saying that it's now getting used in companies and, and organizations to get more out of tired and stressed employees. But there's also, I think, another movement, and my colleague um, I work with, in, um, who's in Australia, Yoko Okama, has been looking at it in the context of, of sort of Buddhist practice and how actually you know, sort of be, being present to your world has a particular effect on what you do and how you engage with it, which I think is really important. So yes, certainly from that point of view. And I think training, can, in that sense, you can train and you can be meditative and so on. But I, th I suppose, um, and it's also that question of how far are people, and this is also, I suppose, speaks back to the democracy question. It's how far are you telling people what to pay attention to or how far are you just raising the issue of attention and whether you know people are actually being mindful in in a I mean I'm not going to tell people to pay more attention to the natural world. In fact, I hate the concept of natural world. I would never make the distinction between artificial and natural along those lines exactly. Um, but there are certain things that we can go on making, and there are certain things that if we use up, we will die. And those would be the ones that perhaps we need to be mindful of at the moment. And how we appreciate them and how we recognise our fellow travelling with them seems absolutely critical here. And that, I find, doesn't necessarily come through going, oh, let's all worry about an environmental project. It comes through, so what happens? Who's growing food at the moment? How did you make it flourish? Why did it die? What does it connect to? And those kinds of questions, which are really ordinary questions. And I wanted to do a big project that kind of went, hey, how do we save the future? And I got knocked back for it in its original form. And so I started just doing the component parts. You know, how do we tell stories? How do we live convivially? How do we do all the things that we actually do that are life enhancing, that make you actually want to be alive? And I suppose that's the other side of the paying attention, that actually you don't direct people's attention. You just provide irresistible stimuli within their ordinary word, worlds. You need to build repertoires. You, you know, you need to know that things can be multiple, I guess. 
Okay. Well, thank you for coming along and listening. Yeah, and yeah. I'm here, and I'm here for another three weeks. And it was a lovely time talk. So that if you did disagree or agree or just want to chat, I'm still here for a bit. So please do. So and before I thank you for this, I uh, just also thought to say to you that if you enjoy this talk and these kinds of uh, discussions, there will be at least two more media talks this fall. On December 7, Patrick Svensson, who is currently the visiting professor of uh, digital humanities at UCLA, will come here to talk about what an active and interventionist humanities may look like. And then on December 14, Joanna Zelinski, who is photographer, curator, and professor of new media at Goldsmith College, going to talk to about connecting to your talk about the Anthropocene. She's going to talk about after man, basically. So, Anne, thank you so very much for, for this wonderful talk, and thank you all for coming.